The suspect was not a stranger. The suspect was known to the victim. A 10-year-old little girl is found sexually assaulted and murdered, and her own teenage cousin is the suspect. Now, a judge has ruled that the teenager's case will remain in adult court as he faces charges of intentional homicide and sexual assault. We're covering everything you need to know about this brutal case with legendary former homicide detective, Phil Waters. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. A judge in Chippewa County, Wisconsin, ruled last week that a teen boy charged with sexually assaulting and killing 10-year-old Ileana Lily Peters will have his case remain in adult court. This means instead of moving it to the juvenile system. Now, this suspect, who's been identified as CPB in court documents, this guy was 14 years old, 14, when he allegedly lured his cousin, yes, his cousin, into a wooded area on April 24th, 2022. Now, that night, Lily's father reported her missing, saying that she hadn't returned from a trip on her bike to her aunt's place. The bike was eventually found later that night in the woods, less than a mile from where Lily's aunt's home was located. And then Lily's body was found the next day in those woods. And evidence suggested that she had been strangled, that she had been sexually assaulted, and that she had been beaten with a large stick. This is according to investigators. There was a lot of blunt force trauma. Now, according to the criminal complaint, the suspect told law enforcement he killed Lily. Then he confessed that he sexually assaulted her body. He reportedly said that he intended to kill and rape her, quote, from the get-go after they left her aunt's home. That's called premeditation. And when he realized that people were looking for his cousin Lily, he allegedly went back to the crime scene, moved her body, and covered it with leaves. He's been charged with first-degree intentional homicide, first-degree sexual assault, and first-degree sexual assault of a child under 13 resulting in great bodily harm. Now, what makes this case, aside from it being horrific, interesting from a legal point of view is that there was a reverse waiver hearing, and it was held over several days last August. And that is when the suspect's defense team argued that he should be in juvenile court. They cited uh, his diagnosed psychological disorders, his tough upbringing as some of the reasons why. According to court documents, the defendant's father went to prison for three years for possession of child pornography and was also found in possession of several crack pipes. The boy's parents divorced when the defendant was two, but they had joint custody. The judge took all of this under advisement and released his ruling this month. And in this ruling, Judge Stephen Gibbs said, Quote, the court disagrees that a possible 10-year confinement in the juvenile system, registering as a sex offender, and that the defendant would be vulnerable to the adult system would be punishment enough for the defendant. Yeah, so when we talk about the difference between adult court or juvenile court, it is mostly centered around the punishment. And my understanding is that uh, this defendant, he would age out of the juvenile system at 25. So clearly you're seeing the judges saying this case deserves to remain in adult court. See, the judge seemed to also be concerned about trying this case in a juvenile court, that that would take away from the seriousness of this crime. Now, it's our understanding that under Wisconsin law, anyone who is at least 10 years old and is accused of first or second degree homicide is considered an adult in Wisconsin's court system. This defendant will turn 16 in March. The teen is being held on a $1 million bond and could face life in prison if he's convicted on the intentional homicide charge. By the way, one of my favorite things about being a host on Law & Crime is how passionate our audience is. You guys don't just sit back and watch. You engage. You leave comments. You give us feedback. You make your opinions known, which I can't tell you how much I appreciate. But one of the most popular opinions is how much you love our police body cam videos. And I'll tell you, I agree. I think they're fantastic. They're unpredictable. They let you see firsthand what's going on in any given situation instead of just hearing about it later in testimony or from police reports. Well, I am excited to tell you that we here at Long Crime, we've heard you loud and clear, and we have launched a whole new YouTube channel dedicated only to police body cam videos. It is aptly named Law and Crime Body Cam. It is your new destination for all of the most shocking police interactions on the internet. We're talking high-speed chases, dramatic DUIs, arrests that you just got to see to believe. So go check it out. Go subscribe. Let us know what you think. You might even hear a... I don't know, a familiar voice on some of the videos? It's me.
to me. I'm not going to lie. I get to narrate some of them. Huge honor for me. Great opportunity. But just click the link in the description. Catch all the action on Long Crime Body Cam. I'm going to see you there. Let's talk about this more with legendary former homicide detective Phil Waters, a good friend of the show. Phil, good to see you. Um, what is your overall reaction to this case? Again, just to tell everybody now, you have a young boy accused of murdering his cousin. Well, good good morning, Jesse. Always good to be with you. My Initial gut response to this is it's a uh, it's an act of evil, and this fourteen year old, while he may be chronologically a, a juvenile, he certainly made a a an adult decision to, to use your words to have a premeditation about slaughtering his cousin and then uh, sexually assaulting her, so in an act of necrophilia. And it sounds like that was the order of things that he was going to, to perform. And that takes some thought, that takes some planning, that takes some sort of, again, premeditation. This was not something that happened in the moment. So when you've got a juvenile that's making adult decisions, I think the judge is right on. Have he needs to be held accountable in that courtroom. Have you ever seen, in your experience, an alleged fam familial crime like this between such young people? Well, I have. I, I didn't work the cases, but I have seen uh, in my uh, tenure at the uh, in homicide at HPD, we did see cases like this where we had family members that were uh, killing other family members, and it's 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 almost inconceivable when you think about families, uh, but in the way our, our culture and our society has developed over the last uh, 60 years or so, I mean, the destruction of the family, I think family ties become, have become less important. And it is, uh, it's greatly disturbing when we see uh, some, an act of violence like this take place within a family unit. I guess going back to the juvenile adult question, you know, people would look at this and, and would disagree because they would look at his age. And, and, you know, I'm not surprised that he is being tried as an adult also because this is happening in Wisconsin and we covered the Slender Man stabbing on law and crime. That's when two 12 year old girls, they were tried in adult court, court for stabbing their classmate. Thankfully, she survived. But there's also this effort, you know, of deterrence, too. Uh, so it's not just the seriousness of the crime but you have to deter this kind of behavior. Having said that, you know, other judges, maybe in other jurisdictions would suggest or say that he's too young, that the juvenile system is the appropriate place. Um, 10 years in, in a juvenile system is, is, is a punishment, would, would go on the registry, um, but you disagree? You feel that the judge made the right decision? Oh, I do disagree with that. I think the judge is, is spot on. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's good to see we've got a jurist that's sitting there and, and is looking at the at the real world, not the pretend world of people that think, oh, he's a child and this and that. You know, the problem here is, is that the decision that he made, again, to, to slaughter his uh, his cousin, uh, Lily, and, uh, you know, I, you know, it's almost incomprehensible to me, but these are problems that go much deeper than just it's a kid that went and did something bad. Uh, this, these are problems, and I've said it repeatedly, these are problems of the head and the heart. Yeah. And, you know, this, this, uh, this kid, it's unfortunate. It's just that there has to be, look, everybody's redeemable. And this 14-year-old this that's committed this act has got to be held accountable for the severity of the act that he committed. Uh, he made an adult decision. I know he's 14 years old, but he made an adult decision, and it doesn't sound like he had any hesitation in it when, you, as you've said, this is what he was going to do from the get-go, and that's a quote. So, yeah, I've got no problem with it. He's got to be held accountable. We're going to get into that confession in a minute, but I, and we're going to get into maybe some of the evidence, but I do want to just take a second to talk about his father, because I think this is an interesting 
aspect of it. So as I mentioned, the father of this suspect, he's identified as Adam Berger. Berger was convicted, served three years in prison for possession of child pornography. He's now on super, supervised probation. He's on the sex offender registry. Uh, the Daily Mail reported that there were all of these letters that were submitted to the court uh, years ago in support of him before the killing of, of Lily Peters in support of him getting unsupervised contact with his son. And they said that this this suspect, uh, he, he looked unhappy when he was with his mother. He was really sad when his dad went away. Um, I just find what his father was convicted of and having this relationship with his son. It's it's not like the father was convicted of mail fraud. Convicted of a crime regarding children. And now we are talking about a crime in relation to a child. From your investigative perspective, is there anything there that you would like to know more? Would you like to explore a little bit? Well, sure. Anything like this. Any, well, any homicide that I work, any murder that I work, I always did a psychological autopsy on the suspect. And that gives me the ability to go in and conduct a, a productive interview in most cases. I, I, I will tell you that. All of those circumstances, whatever these environmental circumstances were with this kid growing up and so forth and so on, you know, that's tragic. It's horrible. You know, the Bible talks about sins of the father being passed down. Now, I, all I can say is, is that he knew what he was doing was wrong. This is, this is the whole point of, of a child uh, going out and committing something like this. And then we're trying to give them a, a little bit of a pass because of the way they were raised or their environmental conditions as they were growing up and that, to me it's not a viable argument but you know he knew what he did was wrong he knew before he did it that it was wrong and then when he finds out that they're out looking for lily what does he do he goes back to the body and tries to hide it tries to cover it up it's just the same thing you know cain uh, killing abel i mean it's the same it's the same scenario i know i say this a lot, but unfortunately, in the stories that we cover, like Lily Peters, the world is frightening at times. The truth is you just don't know what is going to happen. But that is why I want to talk about our great partner and sponsor here on Sidebar, Morgan & Morgan, because if you get injured and those events, they happen out of nowhere, you should know how to protect your rights and whether you could be compensated for what you lost, which, by the way, could be worth millions of dollars. And Morgan & Morgan, the largest injury law firm in the country, they don't settle for lowball offers from insurance companies. No, they fight for what you deserve. I'm going to give you an idea. In the past couple of months, Morgan & Morgan saw verdicts of $12 million in Florida, $6.8 million in New York, and $26 million in Philadelphia. Mind you, this is considerably higher than the highest insurance offer for these accidents. And they make it super easy for their clients because they have totally modernized the process from submitting your claim to signing documents, talking to your whole legal team. It's all done on your phone. It's all done on your smartphone. So all it takes is just a few clicks and you're going to see if you have a case in minutes. And not only that, the fee is absolutely free unless you win. So if you're injured and you want to check out Morgan & Morgan, go to forthepeople.com slash LC sidebar or click the link in the description and pinned in the comments. All right, let's get back into the Lily Peters case. I think you're going to agree with me that if defense counsel moves forward with kind of an insanity defense and tying that to the, the Slenderman case where, where mental health was an issue there, I don't see that working necessarily given the facts of this case because, right, he, he, if he realized what he did was wrong, he realized the police were after him, tried to cover up the body, uh, that, that very different than the Slenderman case where there was an argument there they acted in furtherance of this spiritual creature that they thought they were trying to appease, this creature they thought was going to harm them or their families. I, I, and I know he has, um, and the defense has submitted evidence that he has psychological disorders, but you could always make the argument that anybody who commits a horrific crime probably has something wrong with them. It's the question of whether or not that mental disease or defect, they couldn't appreciate the wrongfulness of their crime. They couldn't conform their behavior to the, to the law. Um, I don't see that kind of mental health defense working here based on the limited facts we have. No, I agree. Uh, insanity is a, is a pretty high bar. I know it is in Texas. And you have to understand that, uh, you know, the, the questions about insa this insanity defense is, is, did you know the planning of it was wrong? Did you know the commission of it was wrong? And if both of those things 
are yes, then an insanity defense goes right out the window. This was a calculated, this wasn't a, an in the moment uh, type of thing that all of a sudden something manifested itself and he went crazy. He went insane and did something. Uh, this was a planned event that he was going to carry out regardless. It just, she happened to be the easy target and she was the soft target. He's the one he, that, that he went for, but you've got to go back. He went back and he covered her up. Yeah. So that, that act in and of itself indicates that he knew what he did was wrong. He knew planning it was wrong. And then he had to go back and cover it up. Let's talk about the confession, because aside from the fact that defense would argue, maybe let's say a mental health defense, they may say that confession should be thrown out, right? I mean, the idea of when you're interviewing such a young suspect, I, I think we have to understand the, the, the terms of that confession. So what would you be looking out for? Because not only did he admit, I, I just want everybody to know, this is where he admitted to killing and, and sexually assaulting his cousin. I'll give everybody a little portion of this in the, the filings. It says, quote, Suspect stated he and victim walked into the woods up the hill, carried his hoverboard, and victim carried her bike. He uh, stated once off the trail, he punched victim in the stomach, knocking her to the ground, stated that he then struck her in the head approximately three times with a large stick, stated that he straddled the victim while the victim was laying on her back and strangled her until he believed she was deceased. And then regarding the sexual assault, it consisted of him allegedly biting her. So those words are going to be what I think are the strongest piece of evidence against this, this young person. But is there a way defense attorneys could strike that and say, maybe this conf confession was coerced? We have such a young suspect here being questioned by law enforcement. What are you going to be looking out for there? Well, in Texas, you know, there is a process by which it would determine on, it would depend on how this interview is conducted. Was he in custody? Was he under arrest? Uh, was it a custodial interview of some kind or was it non-custodial or was it a raised just I statement? You know, uh, there's a lot of circumstances here that we, we don't know at this point. So in Texas, there would be a process if, if this, if the, the, uh, this suspect has been charged and so forth. You would take him before a magistrate. The magistrate would read him his rights and and not in the presence of law enforcement. So this is a very, it's, it's between the suspect and the judge. And once that is done, then the juvenile is asked, would you want to talk to us? And of course, if they say yes, then we go in and we conduct an interview with them. So right. there's a, there's a procedure, a process to go through in interviewing a juvenile. So I don't know what the, what the law is uh, there, and I and I uh, I would imagine the circumstances under which this interview was conducted is going to be within the parameters of that law, and so it's going to be a good interview. Now they're going to try to suppress it. Sure, that's just a matter of drill. But I don't. If, if uh, he takes it to trial and doesn't plead guilty and try to seem, seek some sort of leniency in a way, um, you know, look, Phil, I, I don't want to take too much of your time. I do want to ask you real quick about one final thing that stood out to me. Curious if it stood out to you. Obviously, they're going to they have more evidence than we probably know right now, you know, in terms of DNA. But I just think the crime scene shows that a young person did this in the sense that the spot where her body was found was kind of in the open. It was very close to a brewing company. Um, it's within view of the row of houses on the other side of this large lake. And it seems to me that the ability of him to carry her body or, or move her body, given his age, given his lack of resources, that signals to me that perhaps a young person committed this crime. Am I totally off there? I mean, doesn't have a car, doesn't have the strength of, a, of an adult, does it right out in the open, uh, allegedly? That's just that that stood out to me. Well, I, I think it, it may show the it may show a. Uh a lack of maturity in trying to cover up what he had done in, in, in those terms. But, you know, I mean, obviously he can't, can't put her, put her body on his hoverboard and get her out of there. You know I mean? That so, so sure. But, but those, but you got to understand though, you, you've got a, a kid who's making a, a plot. He's plotting this out and that's the way he's thinking. He's made an adult decision to do what he's going to do. But you're right. I think I agree with you that in the mechanics of it, 
Uh, he, he didn't really think through the end of this thing. That's why he went back and, and uh, he picked a spot that he thought was going to be isolated. He probably picked a spot where she and he may have been before. So that's why she was comfortable going with him to the woods, this wooded area. So we, there's a lot of things we don't know here about why they ended up yeah. where they ended up. I think the fact that he went back uh, when he finds out they're looking for, I mean, what did he think that nobody was going to be looking for her or missing her? And then he goes back and he tries to uh, cover this thing up. So a lot of it, while some of it he had a plan in place that he what he was going to do, but the execution of it, like you said, it was kind of uh, not terribly masterful. And it looks like that he he didn't plan for some things that he wasn't sure of at the end of it. And so I think there's some of that is is valid to say that it was a you know a yeah. young person that kind see of putting my invest- yeah putting my investigator cap on a little bit that's what I thought of I mean I cover enough of these cases to, to say I'm detective out of you yet Jay. <laughs> Bill Waters thanks so much uh, again great to have your perspective on this case I just wish as I always say it was under better circumstances that we're talking but right. good to good to see you Phil thank you so much see you brother. All right, everybody, what a case. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us here on Sidebar. We very much appreciate it. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time.